Hey, Sam, we believe in you, too. <laughs> oh, that was cool. Don't we have a great music department? Thank you, guys. So it's Super Sunday. I uh, was on the phone with a colleague uh, earlier this week and was telling them that uh, uh, the Super Bowl was a week from Sunday and Nancy had to come to my office and tell me that it was this Sunday. <laughs> okay, well, no big deal. But you know, the Super Bowl is more than just a football game. It's actually important to a lot of people. It, it has deep meaning and value to them. For example, Last year at the Super Bowl, uh, a woman was coming to her seat. She sat down very near the 50-yard the line. Uh, and next to her was an empty seat, and then next to that was a gentleman sitting in his seat. And when the woman sat down, the gentleman said to her, excuse me, do you know who's sitting in this seat, pointing to the empty seat? And she said, no one's sitting in that seat today. And he said, no, no, this is a Super Bowl. That's crazy. Why wouldn't the person that owns this seat sit here? And she said, that was my husband's seat. And we've been coming to the Super Bowl since 1967, the year that we got married. He passed away. And he won't be here today with us. And he said, I'm so sorry to hear that. And it's tragic. But didn't you have a friend or a relative that could come and be with you today? And, and she said, no, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> So as you know, uh, the game is today, and we have the uh, uh, we have uh, the Seahawks and the and the Pat uh, Patriots playing. So, and if you haven't made up your mind about uh, who you're rooting for in the game, uh, I can help you. <laughs> Russell Wilson uh, is a, a graduate of uh, North Carolina State University where he was in the athletic programs there. He also played uh, minor league baseball with the tourists here in Asheville. And if that's not good enough, Pete Carroll, the coach of the Seattle Seahawks, is a student of the science of mind. And the Patriots fans are going, no, don't do this to me. <laughs> He actually uh, attended uh, uh, Agape International Spiritual Center in Los Angeles for many years when he was the head coach of the UCSLA Trojans. So uh, uh, he's quite well thought of in, in that community and apparently is using some of that because he whooped your Broncos last week. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, there, maybe there's something there to know, I don't know. Those of you that are a little bit older will remember a show that for many years was on TV. It was called uh, the ABC Wide World of Sports. Jim McKay began that show every week with these words. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat, the human drama of athletic competition, this is ABC's wide world of sports. And as he said, agony of defeat, this is what you were looking at. This gentleman's name is Vinko Bogaccia. He is uh, from Slovenia. He was uh, quite a skilled uh, skier until this accident. Not that he was seriously injured. He had a minor concussion. But every week, on American television. <laughs> this was the agony of defeat. <laughs> he, he never was able to compete again at that level. Just to point out how this works. He, he once was actually quoted as saying, let me read it right so I get it right, every time I'm on ABC I crash. <laughs> Literally, the next thing that he did after this event, he had an interview with ABC and he crashed his car on the way to the interview. Oh, wow. So he has this mindset that 
that anything to do with that now is going to end up in a crash. It's his mindset that tells him that, so he lives in a world of the agony of defeat. Anybody want to go there? No. But it's the nature of competition that creates the agony of defeat. Now, of course, you have the, what was it? The thrill of victory? Yeah. Yes, the thrill of victory. <laughs> But to be in competition, you have to be willing to have the agony of defeat. How many of you actually do watch competitive sports? Okay, fair number of people. You have your favorite team. What does it feel like when your favorite team loses? Now, how many of you are, are obsessed <laughs> enough that you'll turn on the TV, two teams are playing, you'll pick one. And then you'll agonize over their horrible performance in that game, as though it has anything to do with you. <laughs> we do this. We uh, for years. I like, I have turned off a, a sport, sporting events so many times, saying I'm not watching that anymore. I just get too upset. I am so competitive. I have this natural thing about wanting to win, and it doesn't seem to go away. So I turn it off, and I swear it off, and you know, and then I watch the next one. <laughs> and it's not just sports. I got hooked on American Idol. <laughs> There's this beautiful, angelic, singing woman. She couldn't have been 21 years old. She had the most amazing voice, and she was gorgeous, and she could play the piano. And every, all the other competitors in this, they couldn't play spoons. <laughs> she was so much better than them. But what I've since figured out when I got a little objective is that the winner of American Idol is always from the southeastern part of the United States, and that's because people in this part of the country are willing to pay 95 cents a call to vote for those people. <laughs> people in Boston and San Diego and San Francisco and Chicago are not willing to do that, at least not to the same level. So she was kicked off. And she was as upset about it as I was, because she couldn't even sing a farewell song. And of course, just to taunt me, the next year, the guy here at Astro wins. <laughs> so I'm having this thing about competition. And I, I got some support on this, because there are some great teachers that talk about the power of or what you get when you compete. And one comes from uh, Wallace Waddles, uh, the teacher that talks about the idea of competition and the idea of, of creativity, and says some very interesting things like this. Riches secured on the competitive plane are never satisfactory and permanent. They are yours today and another's tomorrow. Now, sports is designed around this idea of competition. So how does that apply? Well. I was born in Miami, Florida. My team was called the Dolphins. I love the Dolphins. <laughs> in 1972, the Miami Dolphins had a perfect season. They won every game all the way to the Super Bowl. Since then, they have won one AFC championship and went to the Super Bowl and Joe Montana and the, and the San Francisco 49ers creamed them. Yeah. Since then, they have been somewhere between pathetic and mediocre. That's 33 years. I am so ready for somebody else to have a perfect season so we could break the curse. And Barbara's talking about getting a Panther jacket. But Barbara's had that jacket for like 25 years, so you might, if you're a Panther fan, you may want to talk her out of that, because the curse may go with the jacket. <laughs> you have to take everything into account. <laughs> On another matter, recently, a... Uh, 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 a, a, an underaged uh, boy, a, ch uh, a child, uh, went to a family court uh, asking for a change in his guardianship. And the judge said to him, uh, young man, uh, why don't you want to live with your parents? And he said, because they beat me. He said, well, do you want to live with your grandparents? He said, no, they beat me too. He said, well, young man, who do you want to live with? 
He said, the Miami Dolphins, because they can't beat anybody. <laughs> this thing about competition is pretty perverse. It kind of catches our ego, and you know, we, we get all caught up in it. And our life gets dependent on winning things. Now, what I want you to know is we're not stuck there. Although there's one more Waddles quote that will help us kind of clear our minds of this. Every man who becomes rich by competition throws down behind him the ladder by which he rises and keeps others down. But every man who gets rich by creation, and that's collaboration, opens to a way for thousands to follow him and inspires them to do so. That's a way to be in, in life. That's the way to relate to others. Now, again, sports, in fact, reality TV is all about competition now, and we, you know, we all watch that, and we get, it, we, we get caught up in it at times. I'm, I should speak for myself here. At times, I get caught up, so I stop watching a lot of that. Um, and because I know there's a better way to do this. You know, let competition take care of itself. In my life, competition, even though I'm, I, I'm truly not healed of it, is, is not, I have found consistently is not the best way to function in life. Even running for uh, the presidency of, of our international organization created some chasms between me and some people because they didn't want me to do it. They wanted someone else to do it, like themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always a price to pay, even when you win, even when you are the winner. There's still a price to pay in competition. So how do we deal with this? What do we do? Well, there's this interesting concept called win-win. Because in competition, it's a win-lose, meaning somebody really wants to win, but by wanting to win, they want someone to lose. And you go, no, no, I really don't want them to Well, yes, you do. If it's a competition, you're saying, I want to win, or I want my team, or my person, or whatever to win, and I want this other person to lose. That guarantees a loss. There's got to be a loss there. But if we organize our lives so that everyone wins, so that you don't accept anything less than a win, you're going to play a win-win game, experience life as a win for everybody, then you cannot lose because there's not a lose in your consciousness. If you're playing this win-win game with someone who's playing a win-lose game, they have the place for a loss. It's there. It's in their consciousness. So guess who gets to lose? Now, this isn't a trick. You really have to want everyone to win. So the game, rules of engagement have to be that everyone wins. Yeah, well, that's not the way life works. Yes, it is. Life can work absolutely that way. We get to make the rules. And we can say that everyone wins. We can say that everybody at our uh, brethren down at the Baptist church are going into the same infinite experience that we are. That's a win-win. Now, having grown up in that, and I'm not just picking on them, in this moment, what I realize is that there's a, a win-lose in that model that they're engaged in. Uh, so, some of us are going to hell, and some of us are going to heaven. I'm going into the infinite experience of life. That's where I'm going. So if somebody's got to go, hell, ain't going to be me. <laughs> Now, keep open the possibility that we may create our next experience. I don't want to play that game. I'm going to play a wonderful game of continuing to evolve and expand in consciousness through my lifetimes. That's the way I want to play it. You get to play it the way you want it. But the way to play it is for everyone to win. So in my world, in my reality, everybody's going to get to experience life eternally and forever. That's what Ernest Holmes teaches us. So when I look at people, I see the presence of the divine. I see that one that no matter what they're thinking in their life right now, is going to keep experiencing life infinitely and forever. Isn't that lovely? Yes. What a great way to live your life. So we have a distinct advantage by the way we teach. We also have the distinct advantage that we're part of this kind of community where we hold each other up, where we don't find fault in one another, where we see the truth the divine essence of who we are. But it doesn't just have to be a spiritual community where you do that. Where do you work? What do you do? Who do you work around? Who's in your life? Can you hold them up no matter what? Can you see the divinity in them no matter what? 
Work on that. Set that as your standard. It's my standard for anyone that's in my face telling me something's wrong. Whether it's they think it's in their life or in my life. The little phrase that's going on in my head when that's happening is, this is God trying to trick me. <laughs> and I'm untrickable. <laughs> I know the presence of the divine when I see it. And I see it when I see you. I know the presence of the divine when I see it. And I see it when I look in the mirror. Now, I'm not suggesting that our bodies are necessarily divine. They are part of the divinity of all things. That's true. I'm talking about the essence of who you are. That's the place where we have such an advantage of thought, where we can see that divine presence no matter what. We can know clearly and absolutely who we are. We can create the lives that we choose, and we can see everybody winning. And if you take away all notions of heaven and hell, what's left? Frankly, what's left is winning. So why not have that? Now, we have all the villains and the evil ones of history. And we, many of us would probably just assume they'd be in hell. But if we're going to believe what we're going to be, believe, we have to step away from that idea of judgment and separation and accept that, yes, even those are the presence of the divine doing that perfect experience of life to create an outcome that we can learn from. All of those things, all of those ugly horrible things that have happened in history. And the more we recognize the presence, the less we can fall into these traps of thinking somehow we are not the presence of the divine. Right now we've got this thing called ISIS. And there are times when I just stop and remember that God is expressing as ISIS. Do I like that? No. But it is telling me that we as a human species must learn how to support one another and believe in one another and stop killing bodies. It's time for it to stop. Yay. Yeah. Yes. And the way that seems to affect us the best is when it happens big in the world and makes the front page of the paper and the evening news and, and the, law, uh, the blogs and everything else so that we see this thing. Now, the real easy thing to do is to go into that and say, this is bad, these people are evil, this is wrong. And I'm not telling you what's happening is right. What I'm telling you is what's happening is an opportunity for we as a species to wake up. For we as a people to say, we can do this better. I say that in my life so often. I can do this better. And when I say that, that's my call, to step up, to remember who I am, and to live from that truth. And I invite all of you in your life to find that in, in the people around you, and certainly most of all into yourself. Once you find it in yourself, it's really easy in these other people, because we are truly our greatest critic. Mm. So back to sports. <laughs> We're gonna watch the, the the ball game. Some of us this afternoon. I haven't really decided if I if I can find something better to do. I'm gonna. Uh, but uh, but but those of us who do watch the ball game, we can play the the thing of picking a team and rooting for them and taking a chance of losing. Or we can simply take the position that this is an athletic contest where some amazing athletes are going to do some remarkable things. And if we enjoy them and appreciate them and, and get into it and seeing them in a wonderful way, no matter which team it's with, we'll get a win-win out of this. It's not that hard to imagine. Anybody see that catch this year? <laughs> that gentleman's name, does anybody remember right off? Yeah, Odell Beckham Jr. He's a wide receiver for the New York Giants. He caught that ball. He caught that ball. Which one? <laughs> the white or the blue? See the ball at the top of the man who's reaching up? He's, that's impossible. I want you to know that's impossible. <laughs> and he caught that ball and made touchdown. Wow. Yeah. That's an athletic thing. Anybody should be excited to see that. Yeah. So maybe if we reframe it, we'll get something different this time. Maybe if we accept the beauty of life wherever it is, we'll get that win-win no matter what. And the team that wins will win. And the team that loses will be back next year. Because that's how they play it. And life will continue on. And we will remember who we are. We will know the truth. And we will live in that truth every single day. This is the truth of me. It's the truth of you. Let's live from that truth. I love you very much. Thank you.